Well, good morning, everyone. Today, I have a word for you. If you are growing weary, you're losing heart right now during these days we're living in, there's a lot of weird stuff happening and people are really feeling faint and depressed. We're seeing suicide on the rise. And so I got a word for you from the scriptures that I pray will really encourage you, lift up your spirit, give you a little boost this week. And um, so we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. I'm Pastor Izzy from Amazing Grace Ministries in Kona, Hawaii. And uh, it's a privilege to teach the Word of God and share it with you. I've had this joy of doing this for about 40 years now. So it's not new to me, but it's um, the scriptures are alive. They're exciting. Like the chapter we're going to look at today, I can't help it, but the, it's preceded by one of the, I think, one of the greatest chapters, Hebrews 11. I call it the Great Hall of Faith. And all these men and women that did great things by faith, it says, and they're recorded for us. I don't know if I'll ever get to teach that chapter in its entirety in depth ever again, because now when I read it, I get so excited. There's so many stories. They're just highlights. They're just little, they're just like, um, David did this and, 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 and Abel did this and, and, uh, and Abraham did this, all these guys, these men of faith by faith, they did these wonderful deeds and these women even receiving back the dead by resurrection you know these are not little things you know really biggies but you read that chapter it builds up your faith I mean it, it really helps especially if you know the background you know the stories those were real people that went through real situations and today we're having some people really struggling and so I want to share with them something that has given me perspective and helped me for years and it's found in Hebrews chapter 12 the next chapter where it says this it says therefore since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, talking about all those guys in the previous chapter, they're, they're like just a cloud of witnesses of faith. Men and women that have done things by faith, and they surround us. And since we have them surrounding us, they're, they're there actually spiritually like around us. He says, let us then lay aside every encumbrance and every sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on what? Jesus. On Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. This is the one we have to put. Now, Paul puts this into an analogy I get right away because it, it's talking about running a race. And I was a, I, I ran track and cross country when I was in high school. And, and so I understand the idea of running a race. And I understand the idea of fixing your eyes on the finish line. When you're running, you're not, you're not focused on the step you're in right there because you're you're you have a you have a purpose you have a goal and this is what spiritually we got to remember we have to have, we have to have the perspective of what's our goal where are we headed we're heading towards jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith we're we're aiming for him that's that's our spiritual goal that's where we have to put our now it says fix your eyes on that not not um glance over once in a while and think about him or you know the the word in hebrew or, i'm sorry in greek is actually the word that we get the word for a rivet, where you take that little metal thing that you, you, you take two plates of steel and you drill a hole through them, and, and instead of putting a bolt that you can undo to take it apart, you take this, this rivet gun and you stick a thing in there and you pull back on it as you do, the, uh, the back side of the rivet expands in it, and it finally snaps off to where it's been permanently fixed. That's the word that Paul says, when you go to, to do this race, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus rivet them to Jesus keep them constantly focused on him now why would I tell you to do that I mean really why should I tell you you need to spiritually keep this perspective of him as the one you focus on because I mean you think, well, what about all the great witnesses around us you know and when I read that chapter about all those guys that did all these great things you, you think why don't you just keep looking around at all the other people that are doing does that does that always help your faith looking around at other people? No, it doesn't. And Paul knew this. Paul knew that even though all these other people have done great things by faith, that really the real focus of our lives has to be Jesus himself. And there's a reason. Let me show you the reason. He, he really brings it out well. He says, you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, it says, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary 
and that you may not lose heart. You have to consider the one that has gone through such hostility, Jesus, against himself. Now, what did, what did they do to Jesus? I mean, we have the movie The Passion. You guys seen The Passion? You know, and they take Jesus and they, they whip him and they beat him and, and they put him up on that cross and they scourge him. And I remember for years I would tell, tell you know, as I taught through the Gospels and came to the part where they were flogging Jesus, I'd be like, you know, um, Josephus wrote about this. And he's a historian in the days of Jesus. He says that the, the, the Roman soldiers were so vehement when they were whipping him, they took it to the next level. They whipped him until the flesh was peeled off of his back, not just the skin, but even down into the muscle where bone was showing as they were scourging him on the whipping post. And it was, it was a, such a sight. It, was, it, just, it made men recoil to see what they did to Christ. And when, you know, when, when Mel Gibson did that movie, The Passion, I thought at least he put some of that into the movie. They, not, not all, I couldn't, I mean, it was hard to watch Jesus getting, you know, even though it's just the actor doing the part, but to think Jesus went through that why? What did he do wrong? You know, the Bible says that he was innocent. He was a, a lamb before his shearers that were, was silent, Isaiah says. He didn't even open his mouth. And he was blameless. Sin, it, there was no sin found in him. The whole idea of whipping was, was as, they were, as they were whipping, the person was supposed to confess something they did wrong in between lashings. And if they did, the executioner or the whipper would, would lighten up on the next stripe. But did Jesus open his mouth and confess anything? No, he had nothing to confess. So they beat him even harder. And so he endured all of this. And, G and Paul says, maybe you should consider what he went through. Consider how much they did to him. What hostility by sinners he endured against himself. And yet he was sin sinless. Now, why should I consider the very beatings that Jesus took for me? Read the last part. So that you may not grow weary, and so that you may not lose heart. Well, if you haven't watched that movie, just watch that and know that as that as, as that portrayal is being betrayed on the uh, on, uh, portrayed on the on the screen, that Christ went through even worse for you and for me. And when you watch that, keep that perspective because it helps you know. Wow, he did that because of me. He loved me that much that he would he would endure all of that and yet it says it says this is what he did and I'm if I just consider it it helps me gain endurance it helps me be able to continue to, to not grow weary to not lose heart I'm able to keep running the race now Paul I like this analogy this race running thing because he started it off by saying with with just because we have a, a great audience watching us, and that, that crowd of witnesses is more like, like think of it being running in a stadium. And the whole stadium is filled with all these people who have gone before in faith. And Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, all those guys are sitting in the stands watching us run as, as the baton has been handed off to us and we have to keep running the race. And we're, and we're running this race and Paul says, when you run it, first of all, lay aside every encumbrance. Every, he says, every sin that easily entangles us. Now, we would never, I mean, if, if you're a runner, you would, if someone said, here, I got this piece of rope, tie this to your ankle, and oh, by the way, I hooked it onto a weight. Go ahead and run. You know, you, you take a couple steps, and all of a sudden, you know, tong, the, the weight pulls you back, and you try to pull it forward, and you, you wouldn't even think of running a race tied up to some weight. Even if it was like, have those people put little tin cans on the back of the cars when people get married, right? Mm -hmm. Can you picture yourself running and you got a whole bunch of little cans hanging back there going, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like trying to run the race and it's like, this is annoying. I cut those strings, man. Get that stuff off me. I got to run. But it's, it's even worse than that. He says that the sin actually comes and entangles. Those little cans dancing around, the strings, they pop around and they bounce. They, they, they wind up wrapping around your leg and tying a little, they're like my Roomba vacuum. I don't know if you guys have seen these Roombas. They're great for picking up hair and stuff and, and, and dog hair around. We had the pet edition because of our dogs, but, but I also have girls, four of them with long blonde hair. And 
our Roomba, you, you know, one little hair, you think, no big deal. It's really easy to snap it. But if you've ever had to clean my Roomba, I know this is a silly analogy, but this, this, I cannot believe that when you take like my girl's hairs and you wind them around the little, the little brush thing that picks up all the stuff, after just one, two days of vacuuming around our house, it, it catches their hairs and it winds them on there. And it winds them on so tight and so thick that you can't just grab them and snap them off the roller. You gotta sit there with a knife or scissors. I literally get scissors. And then peel and peel. And then there's this little tool that slides up and down and I'm like scraping the thing. And I'm like, these little guys can really mess up the vacuum. I know it sounds like a silly thing, but think about that as sin. A little fine sin get, creeps into our lives and we think it's not gonna do anything. It doesn't have any power. I could break it really easily until that little thing starts to get a little winding around your ankles and it starts winding over to the other end. And you get enough of those. The Bible says, you know, a cord of a single strand, two strands that can be easily broken, but a cord of three, now all of a sudden it's like a rope. And even though you might say, well, I only have the, Pastor, don't, don't talk about my favorite little pet sins. They're just small things. They're no big deal. But if you leave them hanging out in your life and you keep going through the motions, your your legs keep going like this and all of a sudden that, that little sin just catches on and it winds up and it starts tying you up. And pretty soon, that thing will easily, Paul says, beset you. It will put you out of the race. It will tie you up, make you trip, fall down on your face and you'll be out of the race. And I hate to tell you this because this is one of the most heartache things as a, as a pastor for you for all these decades is seeing people I saw running really well in the beginning of their walks. They started off and they were really going for the Lord and then a little bit of sin crept in. And that little bit of sin gave way to a few other sins and pretty soon it was like they didn't just have, you know, fine hairs wrapping around but they, they, they pretty soon they were like getting uh, some of that paratrooper cord stuff, you know? You get a couple of those wound in, you're done, man. That stuff is strong. And just one little sin like that creeps in and it it ties you up and you wind up facing it, man. You fall down and you're like, this is, and what do we have to do? We gotta stop and cut that stuff off. You know, when it comes to sin, you gotta cut it off. You, you can't just leave it there. I, I like, I, I'm actually thinking, maybe I should try this new vacuum that came out called a shark vacuum. They says that it cuts the hair as it picks it up. I wanna see if that really works. If any of you know about it, tell me if it really, I gotta find, I mean, I. I know I'm digressing, but that's for real. I mean, just like somebody figured out, hey, this these, these Roombas, they, they, they finally bind up to where you've got to clean them. If i got to clean my silly vacuum to keep it working and performing right, what about cleaning my life spiritually? As I go through this life and I come into contact with this world and I pick up stuff from this world and it tries to wind itself around me, and Paul's saying you gotta you gotta lay that stuff aside. You gotta cut that off and leave it and run the race with endurance. You can't let that stuff stay. Don't think you're a special case. Oh, but I can do it, Pastor. You might get away with it for a while, but pretty soon you'll be hopping along because your boat legs are tied together, and pretty soon you're gonna wind up going down. Because that's just the way sin works. And Paul says, lay it aside every encumbrance every sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance you know that's one of the things i could relate to as being a long distance runner is like you know people that only run short races they think yeah i'm a great runner and they run you know they run the the the, the 40 yard dash or the 80 yard they're like oh, i ran really fast 100 yards i'm like great do that for 12 miles or 24 miles you know but go go do a marathon and tell me how great a runner you are. Because I ran long distance and I was like, look, it takes a little bit of endurance to do. You can do a quick sprint, but can you keep doing it? And can you run for a long time? And can you, at the very end of a really long run, can you then dig deep and sprint to the finish line? When you, when you see it approaching and everybody's breathing on your heels and you're like, I got to hurry it up now. Can you sprint then? No, if you don't have endurance, you can't do it. So Paul says you got to get endurance. Now, our society doesn't say endure anything. It just says, eh, it's inconvenient, quit. It's uncomfortable, stop. You know, you don't have to go. That's not true. You need to endure even things that are hard because, well, look at what Jesus endured. 
Okay, if you feel like, but I can't do it. You can if you have the right focus. If you look at the one, our master who endured the worst beatings, the worst rejections, you said, but I mean reject. You can do it. You have a master who endured the greatest rejection, the greatest heartache, and he did it, and he set an example for us to do it too. And he actually, Paul tells us a secret how he did it. Look at this. It says, Jesus, he, well, Paul says, you guys haven't, verse 4, resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, have you? Or have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? He says, my son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. God loves you. You're his kid. And it is for discipline that you endure. you got to endure because God deals with you as what? As sons. You are his son. He loves you like, a like one of his own children. And he says, for what son is there that his father does not discipline? Now, I know that today that might sound weird, but remember, we're, we're this older times. It says, if you're living without, if you're without discipline of which you, uh, all, I'm sorry, of which all of you have become partakers of discipline, then if you're without it, you're, you're illegitimate children and you're not sons. You say, but I don't feel like God disciplines me. I said, man, I don't know where your, your walk is, but as soon as I signed up, he like straightened up. Spiritual spanking, you know? <laughs> You got to stop that, you know, and there was no like, I wondered whether God loved me because pretty much seemed to be correcting me all the time. Now, maybe you didn't sin as much as I did, so you don't know what I'm talking about. But, but if you, I mean, let's be realistic. God looks at the heart. He knows everything going on. And he, you know, he says, you're my child. I love you. Now, Jesus was able to endure all of this torture, all this torment, all of the things they did to him. Because it says he, he endured the cross, despising the shame, verse 2 says, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne. And he did this for what? For one reason. It says, for the joy set before him. What joy? I mean, what's the joy of going to the cross? That, that's not the joy. The joy was not the, the, the pain of the cross. What was the joy? Us. 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 The ones that God would have wanted to have adopted into his family as his children, we're his joy. Jesus looks at us and goes, you're my joy. I love you. In fact, I love you so much, I laid my life down for you. I, I let them pierce my hands and put nails in my hands and, 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 and nail me to a cross because I love you. And he was looking at us. He's going, you're my joy. I love you so much. I will die in your place. I will take the, the, the weight of sin that is due to, to you, the punishment for those sins. I'll pay for it. And now you are adopted into my family. You can call my father your father. Remember when they asked Jesus, how do we pray? He said, pray in this way, our what? Father, which art in heaven. Pray this, our father. He was saying, not your guys' father, but not mine. No, he's saying ours. He's our Father, collectively. Our Father, which art in heaven. He has called you to be sons. And he is now a Father that loves you so much, he will even discipline you. Now, we don't... This is going to go on to one of the verses I, I call one of the most... I don't... How do you put this? Let, let me read it to you. Verse 9 says, Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to di discipline us. And we respected them. Shall we much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as seems best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. And then verse 11 says, in all discipline for the moment, it says, well, it seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. That's an overstatement. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. You know, when the Lord disciplines you and says, straighten up, stop doing that. It's because he's trying to develop in you a peaceful fruit in your life. It's called the fruit of righteousness. The righteousness, not of self-righteousness. Righteousness means to be in right standing with God. And your sin makes you not in right standing with him. So he says, knock it off. Break away that sin. Take that. Stop doing that. Stop tying that string around your ankles. It's going to trip you up. 
Stop playing with that sin because it's going to it's going to make you stumble. And then he says in verse 12, strengthen, therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight the paths for your feet so that the limb which is which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. I didn't ever understand this verse. I honestly, after all these years of reading this, I, I didn't really see much value in this because I running cross country, uh, we didn't have a track, smooth track like we did on track and field. Um, we, we had to go just all over the billy goat and over mountains and hills. And, and that that's a cross country course, you know, just like shooting through the desert there in Arizona. I, I lived in northern Arizona. We were zigzagging all over the hills and jumping over rocks and boulders. And I didn't have the luxury of having um, a smooth path to run. I just got used to letting my ankles kind of hit the ground and never slamming all my weight on them because you might have it twist a little and, and I would just like continue the stride so that it didn't spend enough time to actually hurt it or, or twist it or do something bad. But this last year we went to the mainland, my wife and I, and I got to be in a motor home there and traveling and we visited Mike Kessler there at a church by the river in, in Twin Falls. River Christian, Fellowship. River Christian Fellowship. Sorry, it used to call it church. River Christian Fellowship by uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. And it was seven degrees outside. We were inside freezing in the motorhome. And, and I went to get out in our motorhome step. It's one of these weird automatic things. To open. You open the door, it comes out, right? And I stepped down on it. And it had a little gear thing that kind of inside the, the motor, it didn't quite catch. And the step retracted as my foot was going down on it. And I was, I was you know, hopping out like I... Put my weight down, not thinking about it, and the step went under like that and snapped my ankle. Okay. And it and it made I heard a pop in my ankle. And then I landed on the black ice on the on the pavement and I I kept my balance with one foot. Thank the Lord. I was holding on to the handle and I was like, my my foot hurt, but I was like, it's too cold to think about right now. I, you know, I'm from Hawaii. I'm not used to not used to doing the you know, seven degrees. So I'm like, get in the building and then worry about how much it hurts later, you know. Besides that, it's like, who needs an ice pack? I got instant air freeze on it, you know? So so I just go, go on into church. I get in there, and I'm I'm like, man, that kind of hurt, you know? Like, I don't ever twist my ankle. I, I've never really, like, felt anything pop in my ankle. But this time, something popped. And it kept, you know, feeling not quite right. And, and I move it the wrong way, and I, I could hear it crunch, like a little clicking crunch. I'm like, oh man, this is really bad. So when we returned to Hawaii, went to the doctor, I visited him and go, Doc, um, see you broke your ankle, what's up? And he's like, yeah, I broke it playing soccer. And I twisted my ankle and how long does it take for, you know, like I felt a little pop down there and how long does it take for something like that to heal? And he goes, ah, you're old, it takes a long time. And I was like, he's such a nice doctor. <laughs> like, thanks a lot, Doc. He goes, well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you to physical therapy and and, and we'll see what we can do for you, you know? And so I go to the physical therapist and I tell him what happened and he's like, okay, well, the most important thing that you do, once you've done, injured your ankle, guess what, what the most important thing he said I should do? Rest. Not just rest. It wasn't rest. I know that's not, it wasn't really rest. It was be very careful to not twist your ankle a second time. I'm like, what? He goes, the worst thing you can do once you injure it is like that is you need to make sure you stay on like a smooth path you're gonna because he knew that I told him hey we walk with our dogs and you know and um, been doing really good but I had to be like like I, I slipped on up the street just because someone's cutting their trees and I wanted to kind of dodge the, the fall stuff and I stepped on something and it twisted just slipped and I was like man doc that I've been doing really good except I kind of twisted it when I was walking he goes that's the one thing you don't want to do you know, you need to get a little brace to put around your foot when you're walking so that you don't, and you need to stay on flat, smooth ground and just be really conscious to make sure your step is correct and don't, don't let it twist. Don't, because it needs the time to heal. It still needs a little bit of, you know, exercise, but it needs to not what? Twist. Get another twist. And I read this verse and it said, it finally made sense. Why did Paul say, make straight paths for your feet? And he said, and so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. 
but rather be healed. I never understood that verse. I, ne I never had an injury that made me like, like light came on. Being, oh wow. He means like if you're already hurt, don't be doing something stupid to re-injure it. Like don't go back to the same. Now you might have an application of this in your life where you're doing something and whether you realize it or not, you're already hurt by that thing. And yet you go back to it. And you're, and you're literally back on unstable ground. And then you're wondering, why am I getting hurt over and over? Isn't it interesting how the Bible has such wisdom? Don't go back to that. Stay on the straight, smooth path. Keep that limb that is lame or out of joint doing well, right? Keep it going on the smooth. Keep it so that, why? He says, so that it won't be put out of joint, but it would rather be healed. As part of my physical therapy, the therapist wasn't like, don't exercise at all. Just be careful when you exercise to do it in the right manner and in the right safe spot. So that you get that joint strengthened and rebuilt and things come back to working again. You know, it's not, it sounds weird because most people think, well, just don't do anything. No, don't doing anything would just make it worse. <laughs> See, you don't quit your Christian faith because you had a slip up. You just don't go back to the place where you slipped up and try to run that, that slippery path again. You stay away from that path. You get on a safe path. You get around the places where you know this is safe, this is flat, this is smooth, this is a straight path. I'm going to stay on the straight, the Bible says the straight and narrow. Stay on that. Why? So that you, rather that you wouldn't be have your limbs put out of joint, but rather that you'd have them healed. Spiritually, there's some people that have their, their spiritual joints uh, 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 is that my timer? <laughs> they, they have their spiritual joints out of joint and they don't get it that they do need some time for it to heal. And and they don't understand the wisdom that the Bible puts here forth for us that, that this is all part of the race. It's all part of doing it right, getting recovered, getting spiritually built up, being strengthened, and having the right focus. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus Looking at him going, I'm going to keep my eyes right on you, Lord. I'm going to go right for you. And I'm going to see what you have for me. And and then we can be healed. And man, it was it's such a sweet thing to see when God restores a Christian man or woman in the things. What, maybe they, they were really bound up. Maybe they were tied up with chains. And God, you know, I hear that, that worship song, my chains are, are gone. I've been set free. You know, when the chains get snapped, you think, all oh, right, now I can run. I'm free. The prisoner has been free. But be wary and, and, and be warned that there are little, little threads, little hairs, little things that the devil will like to bring back into your life. And if he can't get a chain on you, he'll, he'll be happy to just wind you up with a little fine little sin. And he'll just hope that he can keep it going until he's got you all tied up. And you got you to gotta do what the scripture says. Get out the spiritual scissors, cut that thing away, get rid of it, and keep moving on. And that's what I want to encourage you. So if you're feeling weary, you're feeling faint, you're losing heart, sometimes just because sin has slowly tied you up, go to the Lord and say, Lord, free me. You, you died for me. Help me get rid of this stuff. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that anyone that struggling with these things, you would come and you would be the one with the spiritual scissors that would cut them free from those things even if it's bolt cutters to cut away chains lord you make all those things to to drop free from uh, away from us lord that we could follow you and we could run this race with endurance help us lord as as we try to follow you in these days we ask it in jesus name your son's precious name we pray and everyone that agree with me said amen, amen. amen. well i pray that blesses you we'll be back here same time same bat time bat channel next week 10 30 uh hawaii standard time come back i'm praying about sharing a few of those stories of faith not all of them but a few from hebrews 11 so um hope that that will bring you into greater faith come back and join us if you don't mind let me know in the comments below where you're listening from it just gives me encouragement to see how far we can reach with the gospel doing this from my living room and um, i'm very grateful for the guys out there that are supporting us from afar Thank you. Blessings to you. We'll see you next week. Aloha.